5 and 6, me, Mr A, back with um, story time for another day and uh, chapter 8 of uh, Philippa Pierce's Tom's Midnight Garden. Chapter 8 is called The Cousins. Hubert was the eldest of the three boys Tom had seen in the garden. Indeed, in writing to Peter, Tom should perhaps hardly have called him a boy at all. He was rather a young man. Along his upper lip, he already had dark, sparsely growing hairs, which he sometimes touched anxiously, appreciatively. He was already grown to man's height, although he had by no means properly filled out yet. James, too. James's voice was a soft, hesitant growl, which in the midst of speech would occasionally slip upwards into a creaky treble to his consternation. Oh, he would say, and stop and flush in the presence even of his brothers. The third brother, Edgar, had brindled hair and brindled brown eyes that moved round remarkably quickly, missing nothing. He talked quickly and sharply too. Tom liked Edgar the least, although he was the nearest in age to him. The three of them had walked from the house into the garden one day when Tom was already there. They were followed by a little girl in a frilled blue pinafore and with hair worn long to the shoulders. The only word you could have used about that child was tagging. She tagged along after them and then circled them every so often in what might well have been an exasperating way in order to face them and to listen to what they were saying. They were talking about a rat shoot they were going to that evening. The miller had asked them to it. It was to be after dark, of course, and Bertie Codling would be there, and young Barty would come over too, perhaps, and they would take a hurricane lamp, and they would take their air gun, and wasn't it a pity they hadn't an air gun each, instead of only one between them? Tom, from among the nearby trees, listened eagerly, and the little girl circled and circled again. Let's all run from Hattie, said Hubert suddenly, and at once did so, his long legs covering great distances with each stride. James swerved away from her too, laughing, and Edgar followed him. Hattie, as if she were used to such treatment, had already started a quick trot of pursuit when Edgar turned and, stooping, flung before her the hazel switch that he had been carrying. It did not touch her, it was not exactly meant to, but it made her stumble. She fell forwards on her face in the grass and began crying. James heard the sound and turned back and picked her up. He shook her as he did so, but gently, saying, You juggins! You silly little juggins, you! Tom, in justice to the girl, really could not see anything very silly in tripping over some, something suddenly thrown at your feet. What will Auntie say? wept Hattie, pointing to green grass stains on her pinafore. James battered at them with his hands, but of course that brought no improvement. Suddenly he seemed to lose patience. Why did you fall then? You should look where you're going. I can't help you. I'm off with the others. And he fled away after them among the trees. Hattie followed, sobbing to herself, but almost absent-mindedly. She went among the trees and paths, searching. Her eyes glanced continually hither and thither, and she soon stopped crying and carried her head in the position of one intently listening. Tom could see that there was something expert in the way she looked for the three boys. This game had often been played before. Tom decided to follow Hattie in her search. She came across the gardener by the pond. Abel, have you seen Cousin James or Cousin Hubert, please? I don't want to find Cousin Edgar, though. They didn't come as far as all this, Miss Hattie. Are they playing catch with you again? It's the only game they'll ever play with me. Why don't you ask them to let you do the running away for once, and they do the catching? It'd be no good. I can't run as fast as they can. Well, they could give you a start. She brightened. If they did, they wouldn't find me easily once I'd hidden. I could hide better than they do. She became boastful, jumping about on her toes in front of the gardener. I know better secret places, many better secret places, and I can keep quieter than they can, so quiet that nobody ever knows I'm in the garden at all. Can you now, said the gardener admiringly, to please her, Tom thought. I see everybody, and nobody sees me, said the little girl. She was very cheerful now. Suddenly, from the trees behind her, came a cooey. She turned, and Tom did likewise. Edgar was showing himself to renew her pursuit. Although she had said she did not want to find him, Hattie made for him at once. Almost immediately, the other two boys broke cover. Together, they all doubled back across the lawn towards the house. They would easily reach it before their pursuer, and Tom feared that he, as well as the unfortunate Hattie, would lose them. James was the last of the three runners, and Tom had taken a James. He was the kind of boy you might risk picking as a companion in tree climbing or any other, in, any, in any other pursuit. James was going rat hunting that very evening. 
Hey! shouted Tom, and coming out in the open, he put out a brilliant spurt in his running. Hey, James! It was the first time he had ever shouted in the garden. Several birds rose in a flurry, but the boy he had called so loudly by name paid no attention. Tom overtook him, swerved across his path, calling him again as he did so to James. Tom was invisible and inaudible. James pounded up the doorsteps and into the house and disappeared. All three had gone. Tom was bitterly disappointed. He had not minded being invisible to the others, to the maid and the severe-looking woman and the gardener and the little girl, and even to Hubert, who looked stupidly grown up. And to Edgar, who Tom actually disliked, but he would have liked to have made himself known to James. They could have been companions in adventure. Stubborn against defeat, Tom followed more slowly up the steps and into the house. He had gone in thus before, of course, every time he had gone back upstairs to his bed in the kitchen's flat at the end of each visit to the garden. This time, however, he did not close the garden door behind him. He knew from experience that would shut him at once into the house of the flat dwellers. This time he wanted the other house, the house that went with the garden. So he left the garden door open and advanced down the hall, past the wooden bracket and the barometer, towards the marble bracket and all the cases of stuffed animals and birds. He held his breath. Perhaps this time he would succeed in penetrating the interior of the right of the nighttime house and explore it. Although Tom moved quickly along the hall, intending to turn upstairs to where he heard, or thought he heard, the boys laughing amongst themselves, although he moved quickly, the furniture of the hall was dissolving and vanishing away before him even more quickly. Even before he reached the middle of the hall, everything had gone from it but the grandfather clock. And when he reached the middle and could look sideways towards the stairs, he saw them uncarpeted, exactly as they were when his uncle and aunt and the others used them during the day. These were not the stairs that could ever lead him anywhere but to bed. Bother, said Tom. He turned back the way he had come, towards the garden door. Through it the garden lay unchanged. As he stepped out over the threshold, he glanced back over his shoulder into the house. Sure enough, the hall was refilling behind him. Brackets, barometer, glass cases, umbrella stand, gong and gong stick, they were all stealing back, and of course the grandfather clock had been there all the time. Tom was vexed, but he resolved not to let this disappointment spoil his enjoyment of the garden. He would resolutely put James and the others out of his mind. He had already as good as forgotten the girl, Hattie. She had not come across the lawn and into the house after her cousins. For some reason, she had given up the chase. He did not wonder where she was in the garden now, or what she was doing. All right, that's the end of chapter eight. I'll be back again with chapter nine the next time. All right, take care, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.